Welcome to Circa. In this episode, we will be exploring some of the great eras of Hollywood movies through something you may have never thought about when you think about Los Angeles, its architecture. We're going to tell you about some fantastic things to see both on and off the screen that will let you experience a little bit of this Hollywood history. There will be maps, notes, and info on the places we talk about in the Circa app. So sit back, put your headphones on, And let's go back in time. Circa. Love the world you live in, and we'll help you explore it. Mulholland Drive, The Graduate, The Big Lebowski, Jackie Brown, Magnolia, Sunset Boulevard, L.A. Confidential, Blade Runner, Beverly Hills Cop. The list of movies set in L.A. is long. The world that a film captures is part of the story it's telling, but the world captured in a film, when it's part of a real place, tells another story. It tells the story of that city, a slice of documentary woven into the narrative. Think about the Venice bungalows from The Big Lebowski. Bungalows can be found all over L.A., dating back to the early 1900s arts and crafts movement, coupled with an influx of people who needed artful homes that would hold up to the L.A. summer heat. The dude could not have been placed in a more appropriate setting than casually chill, surf and drug-happy seaside Venice in a bungalow that was a signature of Los Angeles. Those bungalows are worth millions these days, of course. In Die Hard, the Nakatomi Plaza is actually the Fox Plaza in Century City, a postmodern 35-story skyscraper. Century City is a small neighborhood of glassed-in buildings housing Hollywood agencies, studios, and lawyers. The terrorists in Die Hard have attacked a rich symbol of corporate Hollywood. What you find when you start looking at the movies filmed in Los Angeles is that the setting and the story sometimes have a lot to say about each other. When you look back at nearly 200 years of L.A. history, you can see waves of inspiring art across genres generally lining themselves up. Sometimes Hollywood builds the city, and sometimes it's the other way around. The Millennium Biltmore Hotel opened in 1923 and is one of the most famous examples of the Beau Arts style, a European-influenced style of architecture that dominated during the late 1800s and early 1900s. The grand lobby features stone archways, an ornate fountain, vaulted ceilings, and these days, a grand piano. The paint is accented with 24 karat gold. When it opened its doors a hundred years ago, this opulent palace signaled the arrival of Los Angeles on the world stage among the greatest of metropolises. The opening gala saw nearly 3,000 people, including the Hollywood elite of the day, among them Cecil B. DeMille and Mary Pickford. You'll want to remember that name for later. Guests were served a seven-course meal spread among the hotel's galleries and ballrooms and serenaded by orchestras accompanied by, yes, singing canaries. This was just the start of a fashion trend in Hollywood that you might call more is more. During Prohibition, the Biltmore operated as a speakeasy, complete with a secret exit to evade police. If you ask nicely, sometimes the staff will show you the hidden doorway off the gold room that partiers used to escape. Through the years, the Biltmore has been featured in dozens of films and television shows. Among them, it's the lobby of the Sedgwick Hotel in the original Ghostbusters film. You know, the hotel where they chase down Slimer and destroy the ballroom? That space was originally called the Music Room and is now the Biltmore's lobby. You'll recognize it. 
The hotel's gold room was an elegant restaurant in The Sting, and the gallery bar has been filmed starring everyone from Jennifer Aniston to Jennifer Gardner. But perhaps the most famous Hollywood story to feature the Biltmore is the true story of The Black Dahlia, a story of a murder that has become legend and, of course, a movie. The tale of a starlet, a young, glamorous symbol of Hollywood, and the secrets behind closed doors. We tell that story in our Dark City episode in this L.A. Guide. You'll want to check it out. You can take a tour of the Biltmore led by the L.A. Conservancy, usually at 2 p.m. on Sundays. We'll put a link in the notes for you. The Palaces That Hollywood Built Many mark the golden age of Hollywood by D.W. Griffith's The Birth of a Nation, which was released in 1915. The film was a technical achievement, but was also unabashedly racist and has been credited with a surge in support for the KKK. Movies have always had an impressive impact on society. What is arguably called the very first documentary, a 50-second silent film created by the Lumiere brothers in 1895, featured simply an oncoming locomotive pulling into a station. But it was so novel to people at the time that it sent the audience running from the theater in terror. The film changed how people thought about perspective in art. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You ain't heard nothing yet. Wait a minute, I tell you. The true golden age of Hollywood really begins when sound was introduced. The first talkie was The Jazz Singer in 1927, although it is a few years before sound really began to dominate film production. Once this happened, the impact Hollywood would have on the rest of the world becomes inevitable and unstoppable. And it's buoyed, ironically, by the Great Depression. Movies, an inexpensive form of entertainment that allow you to escape your reality for a couple of hours, exploded in popularity. The 1930s into the 1950s is often called the Golden Age. Production of movies is dominated by five major studios, which controlled everything from the writers and actors under contract to the movie theaters that showed the pictures. They were MGM, Paramount, 20th Century Fox, Warner Brothers, and RKO, most famous for King Kong and Citizen Kane, the best film of all time, depending on who you ask. Some of the most glamorous houses of cinema were built in Los Angeles during this era. A six-block stretch of Broadway in downtown Los Angeles became known as LA's Broadway Theater District, and by the 1930s, 12 palaces for arts and entertainment lit up this street like nothing else in the city. It includes the Million Dollar Theater, which was the first theater built by Sid Grauman. He would later go on to build the Egyptian, and most famously, the Chinese theater. But the Million Dollar was his first. The 12-story building was designed by Albert C. Martin, a giant of architecture at the time. It was built in an ornate Spanish Baroque style known as Churrigueresque and decorated with sculptures of bison heads and long-horned steer skulls, as well as folkloric figures perched along the facade. The Million Dollar is across the street from the Bradbury Building. Both buildings are featured in the original Blade Runner. The Bradbury is one of the oldest iconic buildings in LA, first opening its doors in 1893. You should check out the interior, the Victorian courtyard with its exposed elevators and marvelous ironwork railings. The Bradbury Building is open to the public. It's seen a great number of productions, from big-budget movies to a Justin Timberlake music video. There are also some bizarre tales about how the architect, George Wyman, was hired on a whim by Lewis Bradbury to design his building, despite having zero experience, and took it only after consulting his dead brother via a seance. Anyway, that's the way the story goes. If you walk this stretch of Broadway, start at the Grand Central Market. It opened in 1917 and occupied the entire ground floor of the Homer Laughlin Building. The market was one of the largest on the West Coast when it opened and contained everything from local avocados to exotic imported pineapples. And it has been operating in this space ever since. 
Start your walk with an egg slut egg sandwich or a pastrami on rye from Wexler's or legendary carnitas from Taco Tumbra's Tomas. And yes, you can still get avocados and pineapple. Further down from the market and the million dollar is the theater at the Ace Hotel. But when it first opened, it was the United Artists Theater. The founding of United Artists was kind of a revolt against the Big Five and the studio system in Hollywood led by some of the biggest names in film at the time. Charlie Chaplin, Douglas Fairbanks, D.W. Griffiths, and tour de force, Mary Pickford. United Artists allowed independent filmmakers to produce and distribute their movies in UA-owned theaters without the kind of interference and control exerted by the studios. Pickford, as a producer, star, partner in UA, and founding member of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, became the most powerful woman in Hollywood. Mary Pickford was born into poor circumstances in Toronto. Her mother put her on stage as a child to help the family pay its bills. After a meteoric rise in popularity through silent pictures, she soon became known as America's sweetheart. Her golden blonde ringlets were a sensation. She arrived in Hollywood in 1910, still a teenager, and after one conversation, she was hired by D.W. Griffith. He offered her five bucks a day. Within a few years, her annual salary was over $500,000. She was one of the few actors to successfully make the leap from silent films to talkies, and she won an Oscar for Coquette in 1929. But before long, her popularity as an actress began to slip, and her focus turned to operating United Artists, writing and producing movies. Pickford worked closely with architect C. Howard Crane to design the United Artists Theater. Crane would design more than 250 theaters in his long career, but this is his only work in Los Angeles. It was modeled in a Spanish Gothic style, apparently by instruction from Pickford and her then-husband, Douglas Fairbanks, who were inspired by the grand cathedrals of Spain that they saw on their honeymoon. They also purportedly brought back from Rome the original recipe for fettuccine Alfredo, which they gave to the chef at Musso and Frank's so that he could recreate it for them whenever they dined. It's still on the menu there. You can order it. The exterior facade of the UA Theater has vertical pillars on piers of light terracotta alternated with inset strips of dark terracotta. But some of the most spectacular design is inside the theater, where every banister and railing, almost every inch of wall and ceiling, contain intricate details. The ceiling of the theater contains a giant circular sunburst with thousands of crystal pendants and inlaid mirrors. It's something to see. These days, many of the theaters along Broadway have been refurbished, including the United Artists Theater, now called the Theater at the Ace, and they host a rotating calendar of comedy, dance, concerts, and movie premieres. Check the schedules posted on their websites. You'll surely find something to see while you're in town. We'll put a list of them in the notes for you. Around the same time as C. Howard Crane was building the United Artists Theater, another building financed by Mary Pickford and her friends was under construction. Not all the same friends, by the way. Mary had a lot of friends. This was the Roosevelt Hotel on Hollywood Boulevard. The group that led this venture included Mary's husband, Douglas Fairbanks, Louis B. Mayer of MGM, and Sid Grauman, whose Chinese theater was across the street. The hotel opened in 1927 and hosted the first Academy Awards ceremony in 1929. The Roosevelt was built in the Spanish colonial revival style with stone columns and formal archways decorating the facade. This was a very popular style in the early 1900s in California, and there are many great examples of it all over Los Angeles. You'll recognize it by its smooth white stucco walls, red clay tiled roofs, strong archways, and secluded courtyards. In addition to hosting the Academy Awards, the Roosevelt hosted nearly every movie star in Hollywood from the 30s through the 50s. Marilyn Monroe stayed here and even shot her first commercial, a toothpaste ad, on the diving board of the hotel's pool. Shirley Temple learned to do her famous tap dance routine on the hotel's staircase. It was featured in the episode of I Love Lucy in which the Ricardos visit Hollywood. 
In Catch Me If You Can, the Roosevelt stands in for the Tropicana Motel, where Leonardo DiCaprio sneaks past Tom Hanks. If you visit the Roosevelt today, you should enjoy lunch by the David Hockney Painted Pool or a drink in the evening at the Spare Room, a vintage-style cocktail lounge with an old-fashioned bowling lane. And you can wander around the lobby and the second floor where the walls around the outside of the ballroom have vintage photographs from Hollywood's golden age. The Golden Age of Art Deco. As the motion picture industry boomed in the 20s and 30s, the city of Los Angeles grew up around it, and an equally opulent architectural style flourished. We call that style Art Deco today, although back then it was called simply modern or modernistic. It's a wide category that encompasses a lot, but is often associated with geometric patterns like interset squares and zigzags and chevrons, along with the influences of ancient cultures like Egyptian and Mayan reimagined in a futuristic way. In Los Angeles, Art Deco might also include some natural elements like palm fronds and ocean waves. Art Deco emerged in Los Angeles with the Jazz Age of the 20s and flourished as the Great Depression enveloped America and rolled out over the rest of the world. There are some standout examples in the city. If you've never thought about it, you've probably seen them and said, oh, that's cool. These are some of the most iconic buildings in LA. Number one, the Eastern Columbia Building. This downtown building is 13 stories of turquoise terracotta with gold and blue accents. Its long vertical ribbed facade holds up an ornate clock tower decorated with those signature geometric art deco patterns and the word Eastern standing out in white. It was completed in 1930, designed by the architect Claude Bielman, one of LA's Art Deco masters, who also built the Hollywood Post Office, the US Bank Building, which is now the Standard Hotel downtown, and the Garfield Building, also in downtown LA. The Eastern Columbia Building shows up all over movies and TV in scenic shots of Los Angeles, and Johnny Depp once owned not one, but five of the building's penthouse loft-style apartments. Number two, the Los Angeles Central Public Library. The downtown headquarters of the LA Public Library System, which opened in 1926, is a massive temple to Art Deco with square concrete towers that evoke the coming skyscraper era and accents drawing on everything from Roman to Byzantine to Islamic styles. The most photographed spot in the library might be the second floor rotunda with its gorgeous globe chandelier, grand archways, and murals that depict California history. In 1986, the largest library fire in American history burned over 400,000 books and caused $22 million in damage. It was eventually determined that the fire was caused by arson, but the arsonist was never caught. The renovations and rehabilitation took years. Most days, you can join a free tour of the library to learn all about the secrets of this historic landmark. Number three, the Griffith Observatory. The designers John Austin and Frederick Ashley presented the Griffith Observatory to 500 of Los Angeles' elite in May of 1935. The giant domes of the planetarium and many of its accents were cast in copper part Moorish mosque, part Roman cathedral. It's a symmetric temple of science perched on a mountaintop. And it has, of course, shown up in countless films, from several scenes in Rebel Without a Cause, to when Arnold Schwarzenegger first appears in Terminator, to the romantic dance under the stars in La La Land. During the 1920s and 30s, Art Deco architecture didn't just influence the design of buildings, it influenced the design of culture, Remember, this was the era of the Great Depression, and people were looking for escapism. Art directors drew on the Art Deco style to design opulent rooms for the stars in their films. Lillian Russell, well, what was the matter with my picture? Well, if you must know, we got a lot of votes from the farmers with the picture of a prize heifer. Oh, you! 
Costumes, too, took on Art Deco flourishes, especially in the fanciful musicals of the 30s, the ones with the likes of Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire. Cedric Gibbons, who was the lead art director at MGM, led the way with Our Dancing Daughters, starring Joan Crawford, grand ballrooms and tall arched doorways and staircases styled with vertical ribbing. Venetian blinds became popular all over the United States. For some other examples of Art Deco in old Hollywood, including Elizabeth Taylor's iconic Cleopatra, check out the notes. The Unique Brilliance of the Wrights Frank Lloyd Wright was not from Los Angeles. Most of his early life was spent in the Midwest, and his early work is centered in and around Chicago. But he was so prolific, designing over 1,000 buildings in his long career, that his influence on Los Angeles is notable. Los Angeles has always been a trend-setting town, and part of the reason for that is a freedom and liberty with which the city views experimentation. This is, of course, a generalization, and there are times in L.A. history where culture leans more conservatively. You can see it, for example, in the movies of the 1950s. But in general, Los Angeles celebrates artists. So when Frank Lloyd Wright began experimenting with a textile block system, the first house he built with it was here in L.A., in Pasadena. This was the Millard House, built in 1923 and designed in the Mayan Revival style and detailed with Aztec symbols. Wright designed a number of houses using this textile block system, and four of them are here in Los Angeles. The Ennis House, which is the last and largest of the four, will be open to the public following extensive renovations, but in the meantime, you can tour it virtually online or see its futuristic Mayan design in Blade Runner. If you want to get up close and personal to a Frank Lloyd Wright design, there are a couple of options. The Hollyhock House, which was his first commission in Los Angeles, is open to the public. You can make an afternoon of it and enjoy the lawns and pine trees of the surrounding Barnsdale Art Park, which is a sweet little green space with a gallery and a theater that hosts wine tastings and movie screenings. Also a little hidden gem for you, Barnsdale Park, perched on the top of a hill, has one of the city's best views of the Hollywood sign. Frank Lloyd Wright's son, his junior, who went by Lloyd Wright, supervised the construction of his textile block homes in L.A. In fact, he was responsible for luring his father out to L.A. for the Hollyhock Project. The junior Wright then went on to design some of the city's most innovative works. He evolved his father's textile block design to build the John Soden House in 1926, a soaring temple of Mayan revival architecture in the Los Feliz neighborhood. It was intended to be a house for entertaining, a large rectangle with four wings that intersect in a courtyard and turquoise pool. It has become a regularly featured location for commercial shoots, and while it isn't open to the public, you can view the exterior from the street or see it showcased in the Scorsese film, The Aviator. The Soudan House also plays a role in one of L.A.'s darker stories. Just like the Millennium Biltmore, the house is connected to the murder of the Black Dahlia. Like I said, check out our Dark City episode for more. War Boom Wayfarer's Chapel, a spiritual sanctuary in Palos Verdes, south of L.A., was one of the last of Lloyd Wright's works to be completed in the area. It's also called the Glass Church, as it's composed almost entirely of glass. Settled among statuesque redwood trees with views of the Pacific and charming gardens, it's a spiritual retreat, and the chapel is open to all. Anyone can join for services on Sunday at 10 a.m. The Wayfarer's Chapel was completed in 1951 in the wake of World War II, and the building's open-minded, optimistic design, with its massive, glassed-in facade looking out onto nature, heralded a new wave of creativity. 
During World War II, the military-industrial complex in Southern California boomed. Manufacturing of airplanes, weapon systems, and rockets brought thousands to the West Coast. But wartime austerity measures meant anything not in support of the war effort was not given much oxygen. When the war ended, Los Angeles awoke to a massive housing shortage. But the positive vibes of the 1950s, plus exciting advances in technology from war industries, spawned innovation. Architects began to design wide, low, easy-to-construct houses in a new style with clean, straight lines, open floor plans, and big windows that looked out onto green lawns. It was an entirely different aesthetic than the heavy ornamentation of the Art Deco age. Families flocked to the suburbs to raise children and entertain in backyards. One of the most well-known examples is the Stahl House, designed by Pierre Koenig a glass box set high atop the Hollywood Hills. Its low, flat-beamed roof and concrete pool, its picturesque views over the city of LA. The stunning architecture photos that graced the cover of magazines in the 1960s have made the image of this house synonymous with modern Los Angeles. It even shows up animated in the opening episode of The Simpsons 2009 season. Wartime technology helped Koenig design the stall house using a method called electric arc welding. This let him construct the house in steel without the use of bolts, rivets, or cross bracing. And thus, his floor to ceiling windows look as though they might well be holding up the roof. At night, the glassed in walls glitter from the lamplights within and the city lights spread below. But the creativity would take a little while longer to show up on the screen. The rise of television, bolstered by people buying houses in the suburbs away from big cinemas, and the wave of anti-communist, McCarthy-era crackdowns on leftist thinking meant hundreds of people, mostly screenwriters, lost their jobs. Movies made in the 1950s had to follow those same clean lines as the construction of the mid-century houses. To counteract the sudden growth of television, while storytelling was inhibited, the studios began to develop new filmmaking technology. 20th Century Fox invented the Cinemascope system to make movies with a significantly wider aspect ratio than ever before. Like the panoramic photo you can take with your phone, rather than the square Instagram frame, which was what movies looked like prior. One of the first films to use this technology was the 1954 classic 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Hollywood was making the case that the movie theaters were still the pinnacle of entertainment. The Dome Cinerama on Sunset Boulevard is the only concrete geodesic dome movie theater in the world. It was constructed at a record pace and opened in 1963. The dome design was necessary to project a new format of film, one that required three projectors, but which could show film in the revolutionary 259-1 format, with each projector projecting one-third of the film on a massive 86-foot wide domed screen. The effect is to fully immerse you in the world of the movie. The Cinerama and Cinemascope technologies, revolutionary both for producing and showing movies, were part of a massive advancement in filmmaking, and the artists of the industry having broken free of the McCarthy-era chains are about to put it to good use. The Second Golden Age. The 1970s brought one of Hollywood's most innovative periods. The studio system that dominated early Hollywood had collapsed under its own weight, and an antitrust lawsuit brought by, among others, Mary Pickford. By the 1970s, an independent, film school educated, and creative young breed of movie makers had taken up the mantle and began churning out some of the greatest films of all time. Filmmakers like Scorsese and Spielberg, Francis Ford Coppola, George Lucas, Sidney Pollack, Roman Polanski, Elaine May, John Cassavetes, and Robert Altman. And one of the most eccentric of the era, David Lynch. The list goes on. This was a time when creativity compounded a positive feedback loop where new ideas encouraged more new ideas. Many of these filmmakers set their stories in and around Los Angeles, 
and often they featured the innovative work being done by another group of artists at the same time, those remaking the design landscape of the city. A cadre of young, more independent architects began to come to prominence in the 1960s and into the 70s. Names like Charles Moore, Caesar Pelli, and another Frank, Frank Gehry. Pelli would help design the Manufacturer's Bank Building on Wilshire Boulevard in Beverly Hills, a curved, round office tower clad with dark, mirrored glass, a brand new kind of look, and the Pacific Design Center, all sharp, asymmetric angles and bold colors, an architectural landmark that both reflects and defines the era in which it was born. It was featured in the 1976 film Lipstick, a dark revenge thriller starring Margot Hemingway and Anne Bancroft. That circular, mirrored glass architecture can be seen in another famous L.A. design, that of John Portman's 1976 Bonaventure Hotel in downtown L.A. Four circular, dark, mirrored cylinders rise up seven floors from a concrete base, and in the center, a single, slightly taller glass tower, the design evoking a building of the future, or perhaps a rocket ship, the indoor atrium, all concrete curves and glass-encased elevators, hold reflection pools and minimalist fountains that encircle a dining area and bar. It's no surprise that the Bonaventure appears as a location in plenty of sci-fi and espionage thrillers like J.J. Abrams' TV show Alias and the Schwarzenegger action film True Lies. In Interstellar, the Bonaventure is a space research facility, and of course, the towers can be seen as a part of a futuristic and noir Los Angeles in Blade Runner. The second golden era, an era sometimes called New Hollywood, and many of the signature films of this era were both filmed in and set in L.A. Scorsese built a stage at the Sunset Gower Studios to film the L.A. city scenes for Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore. The films Point Blank, Robert Altman's The Long Goodbye, and Shampoo with Warren Beatty take place in the city. And John Cassavetes defined the independent movement with A Woman Under the Influence, set in L.A. and produced here without the help of a studio. The film would go on to be nominated for two Oscars, including Best Director, and earn a place in the first 50 films selected for preservation by the National Film Registry for being culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant. Don't worry, we'll put an L.A. film list in the notes so you can add all these movies to your queue. Also, during this period, one of America's greatest architects was finding his footing and making a name for himself. Frank Gehry immigrated to the United States from Canada and graduated from USC's School of Architecture. He would spend several years away from architecture and then some time studying design at Harvard and working at a firm in Paris before returning to L.A. for good. One of his most noteworthy designs was the renovation of his own Santa Monica house, a symmetrical design of exposed beams, glass, and corrugated metal, all balanced together at odd angles that don't feel like they should work together, but do. It was experimental and risky, and it worked. This design, revealed to the world in 1978, heralded Gary's coming influence as one of the most important architects of all time. The movies set in LA during the 60s and 70s show the city in an entirely different light than the optimism of the 50s and the celebration of the jazz age. These filmmakers had a grittier, more verite take on their setting. Hollywood had lost a bit of its luster, it wasn't ornamented in 24 karat gold paint anymore. It was tiled in black mirror and constructed with obtuse angles. And then there's Chinatown, Roman Polanski's noir crime thriller starring Jack Nicholson and Faye Dunaway and penned by legendary screenwriter Robert Town, who was awarded an Oscar for this film. Now, wait a minute, Mrs. Mulray. I think there's been some misunderstanding here. There's no point in getting tough with me. I'm just I don't to... get tough with anyone, Mr. Giddies. My lawyer does. The dark 1974 drama is steeped in the lore and culture of L.A. from the legendary water wars that set the stage to the cynical view of Hollywood's early golden age. Town has referred to the film's theme as the futility of good intentions. Very noir, very L.A.
modern Los Angeles. Today, Frank Gehry looms large as the master who ushered Los Angeles into the modern era. His work has evolved to defy categorization, but it is unmistakable. The Air and Space Museum at the California Science Center, Loyola Law School, the Binoculars Building, even the redesigned shell of the Hollywood Bowl Amphitheater, new designs of his are still under construction around the city. But while his work spans the globe, one of his most spectacular is here in downtown LA, the Walt Disney Concert Hall. A massive construction of metallic silver sails that make visitors feel as though they're setting off on a wonderful journey with the accompaniment of the Los Angeles Philharmonic. This modern LA aesthetic, the idea of the architecture as a wholly integrated part of the experience, can be seen in other new constructions here in LA, and not just as a movie set. In Culver City, a four-story design by Eric Owen Moss, a stack of undulating red steel and glass, like a stack of paper that's been shifted over, houses a two-star Michelin restaurant from chef Jordan Kahn called Vespertine. If you go, you'll be treated to Kahn's interpretation of the building's architecture through your very expensive tasting menu, an experience that moves you through the building as you consume your meal which you may or may not enjoy. Critics have likened it to a meal imagined on Jupiter and called it depressively haute cuisine. But this is LA, perhaps the only city in the world where that might actually entice people to go. Back in downtown LA, the new Broad Museum for Contemporary Art with over 2,000 pieces from 1950 on, was designed with a porous white veil covering the entire facade. It looks a bit like a giant white honeycomb that filters natural light into the building, which was also designed with all kinds of eco-friendly features like high-efficiency plumbing and electric docking for bikes and cars. The Broad's vast vault feature, which shapes the building's base and lobby, has viewing windows so that you can glimpse a bit of what's not on display at the moment. A cure for museum FOMO. It's a design, a mission, and a collection all put together harmoniously. Art forms often influence each other. Those trends can be seen throughout history, but there may be no two forms of visual expression with the ability to influence culture quite so dramatically by touching so many people as architecture and film. They are both a kind of performance art. This city of Los Angeles so often gets a starring role. Sometimes it feels as though you can know the city without ever having seen it in person. But of course, like any work of art, you're only seeing a performance. The truth is only ever what it means to you. Thanks for coming along on this ride through 100 years of L.A. design and creativity. Remember to check out the other episodes in this guide for deeper dives into L.A., including its food, its music, and the greatest road trip in the world. Whether you're heading to Los Angeles right now, sometime in the near future, or would just like to learn all about a place we truly love, you'll get instant access to the full guide, plus new episodes on a regular basis when you subscribe to Circa. Maybe you'll want to check out our guides for London, Rome, Hawaii, and many, many more. For access to everything that comes along with a Circa subscription, be sure to download the Circa app. Circa. Love the world you live in, and we'll help you explore it.